broken down into really two major parts. One is creating the questions, and the second is scoring those questions. Um, when we talk about the questions we ask and the tasks we have our students complete, they can either be restricted, where there's not a whole lot of options, not a whole lot of length to the response, or they can be extended. And you can read about this, Popham talks about this, right? And there's no, I think, any no real secrets to this. You have a lot of different types of things you can ask students to do, which is great. They're very flexible. You can have them compare things, create things, uh, very persuasive pieces, evaluate things, and so on. So definitely well suited to measuring higher level learning goals. The level three stuff, that's what you should use essays for. If you use it for a level one kind of goal, you are wasting everybody's time. Uh, so just keep it to the higher level stuff. The great things about them then can be summed up right here, right? Uh, you go at the higher level, you can look at writing skills, you can look at the integration of different ideas and see if they can connect things. There's really no guessing factor, right? Um, there's the BS factor, but I'm sure you can steer your way clear of that. It also, and this is another great thing about it, is that it promotes learning and critical thinking. A lot of people say that we don't really know what we think until we actually say it or we write it down. It crystallizes our thoughts, it makes something tangible, right? And there's a lot of growth that goes into writing something if there's thought that's put into it. If they use the writing process or the answering process well and they revise their thoughts, they summarize their thoughts, they create an outline of their thoughts and all that other stuff. Now the bad things about them is that they're very unreliable. Uh, very open to interpretation and if you get super structured in exactly how you want things to be uh, written, said, performed, whatever well then you kind of run the risk of shooting yourself in the foot and turning a level 3 goal into really just a bunch of level 2 or level 1 goals. Uh, the other thing about it is that they take forever to grade and you know I can go through 20 question multiple choice test that measures a bunch of objectives and I can grade a class of 20 you know in about an hour probably um, doing that same thing for the same amount of content for essays I mean now we're talking 10 15 20 hours depending on how much feedback I give if you know it's the same kind of three page four page response it takes a lot of time um, the other thing is that unless you're really careful about it, you can't really get at all the basic underlying stuff. You're really working at a higher level of thinking. Yeah, they need to integrate stuff, but you end up going really deep into something and you miss all the breadth uh, and the expansiveness in, in terms of a variety of learning outcomes. So when you're thinking of using essays, again, reserve them for just those higher level goals. Otherwise, it just is going to take you way too much time to grade and take the students way too much time to write. A bunch of recommendations, again, are given. That's great. Now, when it comes to scoring essays, right, you develop a task. You hopefully have an idea in mind of what you're looking for. And you can create a rubric as part of that process. And rubrics are good for some things and not so good for others. The best thing that they're for is that they describe what students must do or learn to achieve a satisfactory grade. And the biggest benefit is clarifying to yourself and making it clear to yourself, what am I really asking them to do? Is it really related to my goals? Or am I just using an old prompt that I found somewhere else because it seemed like a good idea at the time, but it really won't stand up to any real critical analysis of whether or not it gives me information about whether my students can do the things I want them to do. A second benefit is that if you give it to your students, it can guide their learning, right? They know what to look for, they know how much is expected, makes everything much more reliable. Third thing is that because the students know what's going on, they can assume more responsibility for their achievement, quality of the work, and the grades they receive. <coughs> 
When you come to making rubrics, you have the analytic rubrics, which are very detailed. You have um, usually a grid, and in that grid you have descriptions of what different levels of performance are going to look like. Another analytic rubric might look like this, right? It's all kinds of them. <coughs> On the other hand, you have a holistic rubric, where you don't really break things down into a grid, but you have some scoring guide uh, that gives some level of detail about what different levels of proficiency look like. Um, there is not really uh, a lot of overlap between numbers, but there is some. And it becomes up to you to determine where somebody is. I will say that the analytic is really good for giving feedback to students. If you're going to do a project where they're going to be in control, they know what to look for, you want to train them how to think, then analytic rubrics are really good. Holistic rubrics are much better to measure the amount of critical thinking, to get kids to think outside the box, to get uh, information about how they really do approach a problem. And so, <clears throat> as a final assessment, I would say a holistic rubric is probably a little bit better, especially if you're going to share it with your students. Because if you give them all kinds of structure, well then it just becomes kind of going through a checklist. And unless they have that checklist in the real world, you don't know how they're going to act in the real world or outside of your classroom. So the uh, holistic rubric becomes a much better approach. Uh, and it will actually take much less time to grade using this type of rubric. <coughs> Recommendations again, right? And so on. Um, and we'll talk more about this on Saturday. When it comes to performance assessments, now we're really talking about non-written essays, where essays are really just a written performance assessment. <coughs> you can focus on the, well, great, good thing about them is that they do focus on the process and the product. You learn about a lot of skills while you're doing performance assessments in most cases. And it usually can really mirror real world tasks, right? If I want my students to be able to learn about the stock market and predict some kind of uh, future growth or future losses, well, I can actually have them do that. If I want my students to be able to apply some kind of mathematical formula to the real world, I can have them do that. If I want them to get involved in and understand how voting works and representation and campaign, I can actually have them do that, right? And I can <coughs> grade their whole performance on the whole thing. Just like essays, they can be restric restricted, very discreet, right? Very focused, or they can be extended, uh, very broad, very expansive, which when you use depends on your learning goals. Some more examples. To summarize, you know, the greatness of them, the authenticity is far and away the best. Um, it integrates things into real life, makes it meaningful, right? All that great stuff. The problems are, of course, unreliability, especially if you give students choice in what they're going to do. A student A turns in one type of project, student B turns in another type, and how are you supposed to grade them uh, in a consistent manner, right? <coughs> they're very time-consuming to perform and to grade, especially if you have students doing presentations in a classroom. It takes forever, and all that is instructional time that will never happen. And so you have to make sure that whatever you're looking at is important enough to take all the time and all the resources. Just like essays, Final Con, they don't necessarily go that broad into everything you might be looking at. They go deep into one or two things that you're looking at. And students know their stuff really well, but if you know they're choosing from a kind of, kind of a menu of items, they probably don't know the other stuff quite as well. Recommendations. Popham gives a bunch. I'd like you to spend some time thinking about what these things mean. Generalizability, authenticity, and so on. Uh, people tend to have a, a difficult time with figuring out what these things mean. So we will definitely have a discussion board about that in upcoming weeks. <clears throat> when you are making rubrics for performance assessments, it's good to kind of find the balance 
between the super general, less specific rubrics that kind of can be applied to anything, and the more specific things that are only applied to a specific task. You want to focus on the underlying skills. So if I want my students to be able to analyze ecosystems, for example, right, that's the skill I'm focused on. If I got really specific, I'd want them to do things like, say, with the coral reef ecosystem, and everything would be about the coral reef. And then the question would be, well, can they do that same stuff without a coral reef? Can they do it with any ecosystem? That's why I want to stay in the skill focused. The less specific or hyper general would be really just looking at, can they analyze things? Do they have these analytic skills? Do they have critical thinking skills? And that usually doesn't give me any information about the specific goals that I have. Yeah, Popham goes into some good detail about this and has a good discussion, so I recommend you uh, spending a little time uh, looking at his arguments for why skill-focused is really the best. The tips <coughs> for using performance assessment, because of the time, make sure the skills are significant. Again, don't use the performance assessment to try to capture a lot of level one stuff. Use it uh, at the broadest level to get as close as you can to the standards you're trying to teach to. Uh, think about fairness, uh, think about the logistics, don't end up you know biting off way more than you can chew, providing a really great experience but you know disappearing from your family and the rest of your life for a month and a half. That That's not worth it and you'll know, burn out if you do stuff like that. So always consider the balance. Uh, more options for scale, uh, scoring rubrics and uh, different rating scales. There's a lot of ways you can go here. We'll talk about this, but you know you can kind of get the flavor for that. You can have checklists, or you can have some kind of written rating scales or numeric rating scales. Right? Uh, it can be anything, but it can. What you're trying to do again is try to capture really well what are meaningful differences in performance, and then trying to figure out, well, how can I use that uh, to give students back evidence of what they can and can't do to inform parents, to help students improve their skills, and so on. Final thing <coughs> in performance assessments we need to talk to is bias again. And a couple types of bias exist in performance assessments. One is the anchor man or the anchorer, anchor woman. Uh, where you kind of don't like to use the extremes. You don't give a lot of A's, you don't give a lot of F's. Everybody's a C, maybe a couple B's and D's, right? And so you don't really represent the true variability that exists in a classroom. Second one is the X-Man. And the X-Man is the harsh grader who thinks that an A is only reserved for those people who dazzle and surprise you, and you only gave one out back in 1957, and you did it begrudgingly, right? On the other hand, there's the Santa Claus, who loves to give out A's, hates to hurt anybody's feelings, and, you know, everyone's a shining star, right? And the question is, you know, which one of these is better, which one is worse? And the fact of the matter is they're all equally bad, uh, because they all distort the truth, right? You are trying to get valid information about what your students can and can't do, and any kind of bias totally throws a wrench in that. So even though the Santa Claus usually seems like it's okay, it's actually not, because students end up thinking they can do things that they can't do. They don't seek the help, they don't put in the extra effort, right? And then they are not prepared for the future. Um, and there's a problem with every single one of these in that same vein. Another type of bias is the halo effect, where Basically, everything a person who has this kind of quality is just touched with gold. They get all the lucky breaks, everyone likes them, everyone cuts them extra slack, and they have their own set of criteria across everything. On the other hand, you have a more specific bias, which is a logical error of generalization. Usually, this applies to things like if you are a really good math student and you turn in kind of a, you know, half effort job the teacher gives you the benefit of the doubt and says well I, I know they know what they're doing so they'll get an A anyway whereas if a bad student turned in that exact same work they might get the F because they're typically a poor student and the teacher again just says well this is just more evidence that they don't know what they're doing uh, so the difference between these two is the halo effect is general across everything 
logical errors of generalization are really content specific and that's the distinction. Um, Popham also goes into issues with scoring instruments and scoring procedures. Uh, again, I think that you guys can get a good handle on those. If you have any questions, uh, you can ask me about those when the time arises. But that's really it. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. We will be talking about each one of these in more detail. This weekend, performance assessments and essays uh, will be discussed on discussion boards, and there will be a couple other assignments and readings on those in the future as well. Uh, have a great night.